Welcome to Jamaica 411. Thank you so much for stopping by, keeping me company as usual. If you're here with me for the first time, welcome, welcome. Please subscribe, share the video, give the video a thumbs up as well, and feel free to leave your comments in the comments section. And yes, you're most welcome. If you are my subscribers and my regular viewers, welcome back. So nice to have you and you know the ropes right you're going to give the video a thumbs up because you know when i start reading this thing for you you're going to be so engrossed that um boy you're not going to want to stop listening so go ahead and give the video a thumbs up from now also please share so you can bring in everybody um to listen to what it is that i have for you today all right so let's get down to business what is this that i have for you it reads as the title affidavit of andrew holes in support of notice of application for court orders so as you know andrew holes is asking the court for a judicial review this document as you can see was filed in the supreme court in the civil section and you see what the the um that su is supposed to mean private in a butcher you know when it comes to certain things not is private <laughs> right and um so it's a judicial review request the parties involved um would be andrew holness as a first applicant there are four applicants and three respondents andrew holness is a first applicant and his three companies are the second third and fourth applicants as for the respondents Craig Beresford, who is the Director of Information and Complaints at the Integrity Commission, Kevon Stevenson, who did the investigation as Director of Investigation, and the Integrity Commission itself is named as the third respondent. So, I'm going to read it for you. I am going to try and not um, give no holy for explanation because it is explanatory. It explains itself usually law and these documents they are in simple language simple language that we use every day the next thing is what it will do is outline the sequence of events this is what the affidavit does the lawyer wrote up the orders what what the orders it would like the court to find and then having asked the court to grant these orders an affidavit is drawn up in order to support the orders that the the um, applicant is requesting from the court you follow so andrew holness is going to give now his version of events he has taken an oath and he is giving you his version of events his arguments as why the court should grant the orders that they are requesting so let me continue i andrew holness being duly sworn make oath and say as follows and then he proceeded to give his address he then went on to say i am the first applicant herein i am also duly authorized to make this affidavit on behalf of the second to fourth applicants those are the companies right then paragraph two said that the matters set out herein are true to the extent that they are within my personal knowledge and to the extent that they are not they are true to the best of my knowledge information and belief an affidavit is supposed to be about truth that is the reason why you swear to it and you swear to be to give information in your personal knowledge and where it is not in your personal knowledge you know you you're, you're going by recollection to the best of your knowledge information and belief that way you're covered in case you make a mistake all right paragraph three goes on to say that i am the elected member of parliament for west central saint andrew i have held this position since 1997 I am the leader of the Jamaica Labour Party and the Prime Minister of Jamaica from the 3rd of March 2016 to the date hereof. 
which is to date. The second applicant, Imperium Investments Holdings Limited, is a company duly incorporated in Jamaica with registered address at Lady Musgrave Road in the parish of St. Andrew. I am the sole director and shareholder of Imperium. Imperium is a holding company that holds property and assets. So he's giving you a chronology, he's giving you the background, and he is going to get into it eventually, all right? But it has to be laid out in this way so that the judge will have a background as to who the respondents and the applicants are, what the matter is about, and then this, by the way, is what is known as the evidence that is in support of the orders that they are requesting from the court he goes on to say the third applicant positive media solutions limited is a company duly incorporated in jamaica with its registered address at lady Mosgrave road in the parish of saint andrew at all material times the shareholders in positive media were mark azan and imperium positive media is a company that I use to manage my intellectual property and image rights. It also rents media equipment. So he's telling the judge what it does. All right? The fourth applicant, Positive Jamaica Foundation, is a company limited by guarantee without share capital with its registered address at Herb McKinley Drive, Kingston 6 in the parish of St. Andrew. Positive Jamaica is not actively engaged in business, but I use it to make grants and or donations and or to assist persons who from time to time appeal to me for help. The company is not a registered charity. Hear that? The company is not a registered charity, although I loosely say that I use it for charity purposes. The allegation that I misappropriated funds from a registered charity is false and irresponsible. A quick check at the Registrar of Cooperative Societies would confirm that it is not registered as a charity. I deny the allegation of misappropriation. Throughout the investigation, the allegation of misappropriation of bond proceeds was not put to me by the second respondent, Stevenson. Therefore, I was not given an opportunity to respond to this allegation, which would have clarified this issue. No, is a serious allegation. This is very serious, you know. An allegation was made that the FID need to, to, to investigate for misappropriation of funds, and it was never put to him. He was never asked for an explanation is what wholeness is saying on the oath. Now it is possible because of the length of time of the investigation that the investigator may not have realized he didn't put, the, put it to the prime minister. But I don't know how that could be because he should have um, in his question, list of questions, the question asked and what the responses were. But he's human. He's entitled to make his mistakes. I will give him the benefit of that doubt. Let us continue. That this matter concerns the report of the 30th of August 2024 and the special report dated the 5th of September 2024. The reports are being challenged on the basis set out in the Notice of Application for Court Orders that is filed with this matter. Having read the reports, I am now knowing for the first time, that what was referred to the second respondent, Stevenson, for investigation are as follows. So they are taking this now from the report itself. The declarant's net worth was calculated based on the information that was included on the statutory declaration for year ended 2021 and additional information provided by the declarant. And he has three bulleted points. First one is net worth grew by 51.5 million over the five-year period that ended December 31, 2021. 
This calculation includes the conversion of income and net worth from U.S. to Jamaican dollars. Bullet 2, unexplained changes in the net worth was calculated as 4.5 million net effect for the year ended December 31, 2021. Bullet 3 says, although the declarant's net worth appeared to align with income for some years, the growth of the net assets of the companies for which the declarants and close family members are majority shareholders and the actual contributions of the minority shareholders need to be further examined. A copy of each report is being shown to me and marked AH1A and AH1B. Those are the exhibits. Paragraph 8. That I was asked questions over my objections about the matters in the second bullet point and you will recall that the second bullet point is asking him about the 4.4 million unexplained changes in his assets so let me continue i was not asked any questions about the matter in the first and second bullet points as the notice of interview and attachments 1 to 23 enclosed in letter dated the 18th August 2023 will show. So in the raft of questions that was sent to Holness, he's saying he was never asked about that, that $51.5 million uh, over the five-year period and he was not asked anything about his net worth. Now, isn't that amazing? All right, so he attached the letter as part of the exhibits. Um, actually, it's on a USB because it's enough. Paragraph 9, the statement that my refusal to provide the second respondent, Stevenson, with a breakdown of expenses for the period covered by the investigation hindered him in the investigation is false for the following reasons. A, I was not asked to provide any income and expense statements for 2019 and 2020. B, I was not referred to for financial investigation pursuant to section 47 of the integrity commission act c only the 2021 declaration was referred to the second respondent for investigation you hear that hmm. d the report shows that he had already arrived at negative net worth for 2021 and 2022 for me which would not necessitate an inquiry into my income and expenses. In other words, he's saying it was not above, it was below, it was a negative. In other words, my net worth was negative 10 million, remember that? And negative 5 million for him. It was the companies that had a positive um, net worth that they were investigating. So he's saying, based on my statutory declaration, there was no need at all for you to have um, launched any investigation because there was no question of illicit enrichment because I made losses. That's basically what he's saying. He goes on to say in E, it was only after the improper combination of the first and second applicants, which is him and Imperium, assets that he arrived at the sum of 1.9 million. I have been reliably informed by my attorneys at law and do verily believe that this sum would not trigger an explanation under section 14.5. What he's saying, even as they went ahead and improperly, in, I suppose he meant in terms of accounting, improperly combining his assets as well as that of the company and arrive at the 1.9 million that alone still is not enough to trigger um, any belief on their part that he would have breached section 14.5 which is the section of the corruption prevention act that deals with illicit enrichment all right great that's what he's saying Paragraph 10 says that I have been reliably informed by my attorneys at law and do verily believe that the second respondent, Stevenson, collected evidence, analyzed it, made findings of fact, all while combining the roles of investigator, prosecutor, 
and judge. He to say that <laughs> he was overstepping in bounds. Moreover, the section under which he purportedly proceeded or was directed to proceed, I have been reliably informed by my attorneys at law and do verily believe, places a burden on me to prove an essential element of the offense of illicit enrichment, that is the wealth element. The problem is compounded by the fact that the respondents already had the sum that I was required to explain, but failed to disclose it to me that I could adequately respond or cause representations to be made on my behalf to resolve the matter. What is he saying here? They knew that they needed this 1.9 million to be explained and they never passed it over to him. Remember in one of my videos, I did say that. I said I saw nowhere where the investigator said that he had asked Andrew Holness about this 1.9 million and asked him to explain it. Would have saved a lot of time and a lot of money. But he didn't do that. And here it is that Holness is also confirming that he was not asked. So you see, we were not wrong when we said that that was not um, reported by the investigator that he had put any such question about the 1.9 million and asked Andrew Honest to explain where this unexplained um, increase in his assets came from. Follow? Great. In addition, I have been reliably informed by my attorneys at law and do verily believe that the contents of the report disclosed the personal and private information of the applicants in breach of privacy and the data protection laws of Jamaica. It was more than is necessary to make the report to Parliament. I was asked questions in a vacuum and I was only provided with the documents in Appendix 1 to 23. So he's saying that some of the information that was disclosed was not necessary right about the applicants he was talking specifically about the applicants but i would also point out that they mentioned his parents name they should have probably used initials since they are not under investigation for any reasons when they talk about andrew holness's um account with ncb capital market they mentioned the account number and they also mentioned the account number of i think it was positive media or imperium they should not have done that either the Integrity Commission Act provides for confidentiality of the proceedings as well as the excision of prejudicial material if there is a finding of corruption or an offense under the Act. What does that mean? It means that the prosecutor will go through the report and take out anything at all that she feels would prejudice her case were she to bring um, a prosecution. But in this case, she had not um, accepted the recommendation to prosecute, so it would not arise, but he made the point. The objections that I put forward were dismissed without a hearing. This was improper given the substantial nature of the objections that in some cases went to the respondent's jurisdiction, meaning to say they had no right or he was questioning whether they had a right to be asking the questions in the first place, but they just went ahead anyway. In addition, I have a right to privacy. The second and third respondents, which would be, um, which would be Stevenson and the commissioners, the commission, deliberately ignored my objections through counsel and published a report imputing criminal and unethical conduct to me and the other applicants and them can and the thing about it he can't sue them can't sue them for defamation because their report is privileged so the only thing he can do is apply to the court for a judicial review it's the only remedy he has available to him and that's what this is all about paragraph 12 states that the report raises a number of issues concerning natural justice or procedural fairness breach of my constitutional rights and illegal and ultra-virus conduct of the Commission and its directors of investigation and information and complaints 
such that the said reports are tainted and ought to be struck down. What is he saying? Ultravirus means that they acted without legal authority. And he's saying that in light of that, the report itself should be struck down. That the investigator had gone beyond what he was authorized to do is basically what that is saying. So they are now given the reasons why the report should be struck down. The second and third respondents acted ultra-virus illegally and unfairly in carrying out their statutory duty having regard to the referral that is set out on page 4, paragraph 1.1 of the report. That's exactly what we're talking about. What the commissioners had referred to the investigator to do was to look into the the minority shareholders of the companies to see what their contributions were. That's it. The respondents knew the third respondent did not make the referral as confirmed by letters of the 26th of April 2023, the 5th of May 2023, and the 5th of September 2024. So all three respondents knew that the third respondent, who are the commissioners, did not make the referral, and it's, and it's being confirmed in the three letters that, that's mentioned. That's what he's saying. They knew that the second, third, and fourth applicants, the companies, were not notified of the referral, or in any event, that the information that they had did not rise to the level that required explanation by me as it was acknowledged that my net worth appeared to align with the income so that any investigation on the basis of illicit enrichment did not arise. He has a point. So if the net increase or decrease lines up with his past um, declarations in terms of the up and down of it, the net worth, right? Why were they digging into his affairs and not just the companies? That's what he's saying. He goes on to say, at three, they knew that the alleged unexplained sum for the year ended the 31st of December 2021 was only 4.4 million, but this was never disclosed to me for explanation as required for an investigation for illicit enrichment to commence. In addition, there is no statement that this sum is a disproportionate sum. You get that? They never told a man that they were um, investigating him for an unexplained amount of 4.4 million. He, he wasn't given a figure. And he's saying that in addition to that, they said that it was, this, it was a disproportionate sum. But they never said why it is a disproportionate sum. What is disproportionate about it? Anyway, let me continue. They knew that the ultimate objective of the investigation was to troll through the second to fourth applicants' private information. They failed to notify them and thereafter made adverse findings without hearing from them. So they were supposed to have written to the companies, the three companies, remember they are legal persons, you know, right? Under the law. So they should have been written to, and the same questions put to wholeness, put to the company, whoever it is that is the or the, the person with the authority to speak on the company's behalf would give them the answer. That's the procedure. They only ask questions about the second to fourth applicants, the companies, and business associates, but ask nothing about the substance of an investigation for illicit enrichment. So based upon the questions that we're asking, they were asking, they were not questions that would have led them to any information um, for illicit enrichment is basically what he's saying. It is therefore improper to suggest that I am the reason that prevented them from completing their investigation as they had the alleged figure that required explanation from the outset, never disclosed it, and now want to continue their illegal quest by pretending that I have withheld information and improperly communicating it in a manner that they knew would attract public odium and cause prejudice 
to me. I think that's self-explanatory, don't you? So let me continue. 13. As a parliamentarian, I am aware that I am required to file an annual declaration each year at the 31st March for the prior year. I have complied with this requirement in relation to the subject matter of this claim having filed my declaration for 2021 on the 29th of March 2022. The statutory declaration is done using a prescribed form from the third respondent, the Commission. The declaration is submitted to the Integrity Commission, which is a commission of Parliament. Over the period 1997 to 2020, I have submitted my statutory declarations as required, and they have been certified and or published as required. So what is Holden saying between 1997 to 2020? That is 23 years, and in all that time, his statutory declarations have been checked, examined, and certified by the previous um, um, Integrity Commission. Since these guys came into being, in 2018, all of a sudden, there's this big investigation into his statutory declarations. And what is more, they came up with nothing. They came up with nothing. And he's arguing to the court that there was no reason for them to be looking into his affairs. There was no, nothing suspicious that would have, would have um, caused them to do so and want the court to, to you know, grant them the orders that they were requested. We haven't got the orders yet, but we'll have that for you shortly. I submitted my statutory declaration for the 31st December 2021 within the time required. I was called in and met with the second respondent, Stevenson, as it was referred for investigation. I was asked to submit amended statutory declaration thereafter. The investigation was closed as I understand it on the 19th of February 2023. That was the first investigation when he had left off the three dormant accounts. You remember that? Yes, that was the first in investigation was closed on February 19, 2023. So he's telling us that that was his understanding. However, nothing was published exonerating me and I was not asked to exercise my right to refuse publication of the exoneration. You remember when the director of investigation in his report said that that first investigation, which was closed, was never tabled in Parliament. You remember when he said it? That almost gave the impression that it went to Parliament, but the, par but, but the Speaker and the President of the Senate did not table it. But you know that we at Jamaica 411, we, we, we remember things. And what we recall was when the kerfuffle was going on about these tabling, they had put out a statement saying, that no report that they have sent to Parliament is outstanding. You remember that? Exactly. And that means that they did not send the closing of that investigation to the Parliament to be tabled. And what, and what Holness is saying is that they did not ask him whether or not he would refuse them publishing it. They never asked him. They just did not send it to Parliament. As a matter of fact, it still has not been tabled in the Parliament. They haven't sent it forward because it was not submitted with the report into illicit enrichment and false statement. So that is an interesting thing, isn't it? Anyway, Holness says, I became alive to my right in this respect only because of the ongoing issues arising in the subject matter of this application when I was advised by my attorneys at law, Henley Gibson, Henley. So an uh, attorney tell him, say, hey, them should have um, sent it to the parliament to be tabled because that is what the law requires. And the only way that can be bypassed is if they had come to you and asked you, what you say, you, you want it, you want to send it to parliament? We don't have to. And they did not ask you. So there you are, another breach by the commissioners now, or very possibly by Greg Christie, who is the executive director. All right, so at 17, on or about the 26th of April, 2024, that actually should be 2023. So on or about the 26th of April, 2023, 
I received a letter dated the 26th of April 2023 from Mr. Craig Beresford, the first respondent. In that letter, I was advised that the third respondent, the Commission, had examined my 2021 declaration as well as the other information provided. He stated that the matter would be escalated, meaning to say I'm going to refer it to the commission, right, or to the investigator. And then he submitted a copy of the letter as exhibit. That I was surprised by the letter, having regard to the fact that I had responded to all of the inquiries and I was not asked to clarify anything following my answers. Shortly thereafter, I received letter dated the 5th of May, 2023, from the second respondent, that is the investigator. He advised that my declaration, which I understood to be the 2021 declaration, was referred to him by the first respondent. And they're quoting, on behalf of the third respondent on the 3rd May 2023 for consideration. You heard that? You recall that in the timeline that the investigator provided the, the, uh, the parliament in the report, he had said that the referral came from the commissioners. Now, wholeness is exhibiting a letter, right, as evidence which he is claiming that Beresford had sent the letter directly to the investigator, the director of investigator, right? Not to the commissioners and not the commissioners to the investigator. Now, of course, the law, as far as we read it, stated that he can do so. He can, he can receive referrals either from the commissioners or directly from the the um the director of information and complaints but it seemed as if the practice in-house was that the referral should come from the director of information and complaints to the commissioners and then the commissioners are the ones now who would refer the matter to the investigator but i seem to recall that it says that the that the referral can be made directly to the Director of Investigation from the Director of Information and Complaints. But they must know, them are the lawyers, so they read that no one has it It must cut through the commissioners, and the commissioners are the ones now who must make a decision whether or not they're going to refer it to the Director of Investigation. So the, the judge will make a decision on that. They went on to say, on receipt of this letter, I became even more concerned, and so I retained attorneys at law, Henlin, Gibson, Henlin, to represent me. I do not remember if I made an inquiry or if my lawyers did, but an inquiry was made as to the basis of the referral for investigation. By letter dated the 26th May 2023, I was advised by the second respondent, Stevenson, that new matters had arisen and they are exhibiting the letter that they got from Stevenson at 2021. They say, to date, I have never been advised what those new matters are. And as will be shown, I have asked through my attorneys and I have also observed that I was being asked for the most part the same questions that I was asked prior to the first investigation. So they asked the man the question already and come back asking the man the same questions again. I mean, this sounds like harassment. I see. Anyway, it goes on to say that I was advised by my attorneys at law and do very leave that in relation to statutory declarations, if the first respondent believes that it is to be sent for investigation, it must be provided to the third respondent, which is the commissioner, for further and necessary action, which I have been advised by my attorneys must include a consideration and a decision. That's the procedure they are saying. On that consideration and prior to the decision notifying the second respondent, the investigator, I am advised by my attorneys at law and do verily believe that I am entitled to be heard 
on the matters of concern by the first respondent, that is Beresford, or that would trigger an investigation. So what is the Prime Minister saying? When Beresford found that he had an issue, rather than go straight to the investigator, the first thing he was supposed to have done is contacted him, the declarant, Andrew Holness, and ask him to give an explanation. Remember we did read that in the law? Yes, that he said he did not do, and therefore that was a breach of his rights. I imagine that's what he said. He went on to say, my concern in this case is that this matter was referred to investigation by the first respondent without reference to the commission for further and necessary action, including consideration and a decision. So they are saying that Beresford, you remember the man that didn't want to a portion in our cabinet? Yes, man, him say, man. He's the one that receives the statutory declaration. He's supposed to examine them make sure everything is in order and then send it on to the commissioners for certification what Andrew Holness is saying is that he went and examined his declaration instead of sending the uh, referral to the commissioners he went and directly sent it to the director of investigation that's what he's saying he went on to say at 23 that based on this concern, I caused my attorneys at law to write to the third respondent, the commissioners, to the attention of the chairman, Justice Seymour Panton, retired, to express my concern and or objection about and or to the procedure and to ask what the new matters were, the reason for not advising me of what the new matters were, and the reasons for referring the matter to the second respondent, which is the investigator. This letter is dated the 20th of June, 2023, and he has laid it um, as an exhibit. And we will come back and uh, with some more of the affidavit of Andrew Holness um, well, tomorrow. So stay tuned, but I'm going to leave it here for now. Well, how do you enjoy it so far? Do you find it interesting? Please let me know in the comment section. All right, so until tomorrow, thank you so much for joining me. Remember to share and give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. So until next time, take good care of yourselves and walk good.